The U.S. Senate could soon be changing once again the way it approves nominees for critical jobs in the administration and in the federal judiciary. Senate Republicans are aiming to reduce the time senators have to consider these nominees and to speed up the nomination process. They set the stage today for a potential rule change this week. Democrats are criticizing the move for its potential to push the federal courts in an even more ideologically conservative direction, while Republicans argue it is simply about denying President Trump the people he wants. The significant rule change will help Donald Trump and his Republican enablers in the Senate to more swiftly pack our district courts with ideologically driven judges, judges who will make biased rulings in line with their personal ideological beliefs and not based on the law or the Constitution. You see, this is not about actually debating people whether they're qualified or not qualified. This is about preventing President Trump from getting nominees by locking up the floor and making sure that he can't actually hire staff or can't actually put people on the court. Here with me to discuss not just this Senate rule change, but the federal judiciary more generally, are two former longtime Senate Judiciary Committee staffers with firsthand experience with nomination battles. Christine Lucius was a senior aide to Democratic Senator Patrick Leahy and is now at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. And Tom Jipping is now at the Heritage Foundation. He previously served as a senior aide to former Republican Senator Orrin Hatch. And we thank both of you for being here with us. Um, I'm going to start with you, Christine Lucius. Explain just in brief what this rule change that the Senate majority wants to push through. How would it work? What they want to be able to do is they want to break the Senate rules to move faster on President Trump's district court nominees and some of his executive political appointments. What we're focused on here today is talking about the effect it would have on the courts. So we're focused on that piece of the resolution that would make it faster uh, to get to get Trump's presidential judicial appointments confirmed. The problem, though, that we're very worried about is why they're doing this. What has happened recently with several district court nominees is they have hidden their records and only at the last minute have things come out to show histories of bias and other controversies. And that is the concern, that the reason they're trying to speed this up is to keep those records hidden. Thomas Chipping, first of all, you agree that this is all about speeding it up, but what about the concern that Ms. Lucius has already right out? Well, it, it I don't know. I don't know if it is about speeding up. We got to be clear about what portion of the process this rules change affects, and it's only the very last, very small portion of the process after the Senate has already voted to end debate on a nomination. Uh, th there are plenty of examples of nominees who no one opposed, whose nomination was in the Senate for almost a year. And this last teeny little piece is not going to, I don't think, speed up the process all that much. It is certainly not going to hide anything. There will be all of the rest of the process, the hearings, all of the rest of the investigations and scrutiny to uncover the information that uh, Christine was talking about. So Christine Lucius, he's saying it's not, it's not going to hide anything, that there will have been all this time beforehand. Well, I can give you some concrete examples where at that very last moment in the post-cloture time, which is that time this after... This is a reference to what the, happens in the Senate when they take a vote and they need a certain number without getting into exactly, all... Exactly. Sorry. Yeah. But in that last moment is when the Senate decided to reject Thomas Farr to the court in North Carolina because new evidence had come out about his efforts and his involvement in disenfranchising black voters in North Carolina. I, I, don't, I do not think that's an accurate description of the process of, of evaluating Tom Farr. He had been nominated to that same position a dozen years earlier, and the information Christine's talking about had been in the public record and discussed for a year before the Senate decided not to move forward with this nomination. It was not new information that came out at the last right. minute. Actually, there were news reports that came out after his hearing. In fact, Senators Booker and Harris asked for a new hearing based on news reports that came out after his hearing. But even more information came out 
when there was a civil rights attorney who got involved and was willing to come forward talking about Thomas Barr's involvement. It is it, exactly this type of thing at the last minute when we're talking about a lifetime appointment that we're worried about. Well, let me, let's get to that point, whether, whether we agree on what happened with Mr. Farr, uh, Tom Jipping. Why, why not take the time that's necessary? These are lifetime sure, there, appointments. Sure, there is plenty of time. What we're talking about here is how much time to de is available to debate a nominee after the Senate has decided to finish debate. It is the right. last few hours of a very long process. And the effect of these kinds of delays and obstruction is that today we have the highest sustained level of district court vacancies in American history. We have 140 vacancies across the federal judiciary and have been in the triple, that have been in the triple digits for more than two years. This but, is devastating to the judiciary. But don't you also have under President Trump in his first two years more judges approved for the, for the uh, district uh, federal district positions than even un than under President Obama. No, in fact, well, in fact, it, President Trump made 159 nominations in his first two years. President Obama made barely over a hundred. So you can expect the number of confirmations to be higher. However, as a percentage of those nominees, the Senate confirmed fewer for President Trump than it did for President Obama. What, I want to come back, uh, come to the point, um, uh, Christine Lucius, about whether, I mean, the basic question, doesn't every president have the right to nominate whoever he wants or she at some point in the future it, it, to sit on these federal uh, the on these federal Presidents judges? absolutely have the right to nominate whomever they want, but the Senate is what we're talking about today, and the Senate has an independent role under the Constitution. The Senate must decide and must carefully vet these lifetime appointments before weighing in. And so what we're seeing today is an effort to have the Senate go faster, but we're also seeing a president who is nominating people with records of bias, and that is giving civil rights advocates like myself real concern about speeding up that What do you process. mean records of bias? Records of bias like Thomas Farr had, like Matthew Kazmarek has. This is one of the pending district court nominees who could be up in very short order. Who, who has called people who are transgender delusional, as an example. How would that person, as a judge, be fair to people from the LGBT community? But, but, on, but honestly, de Democrats in the Senate also vote in record numbers against nominees who, about whom there's no controversy at all. I looked at the appeals court nominees, for example, from President Trump, who were unanimously rated well qualified by the American Bar Association. They received an average of 35 votes against them for confirmation. That, that is unheard of in the history of this process. So it, it's not just one or two district court nominees who have a little bit of controversy, this kind of rule change is, it needs to be put in place so that the normal part of the process works efficiently. It's a much bigger subject and only in about a half a minute left can each of you explain why this matters so much. What is at stake here in just, in just a few sentences? So what is at stake here is whether our civil rights laws or any law that you care about will be upheld. At the end of the day, courts are the place of last resorts, whether you care about access to health care. You spoke earlier in your news summary about that pending case in district in Texas. That was a district court judge who ruled that pre-existing conditions should no longer be protected. So whether it's access to health care or voting rights, the courts are the place where all of us get our rights upheld. In just a sentence, what's at stake? We, we, you know, there are conflicts over individual nominees in a few cases, but we need a process that works so that the Senate as an institution does its job. We have record vacancies today. We have t twice as many vacancies as Christine's organization once said was a vacancy crisis. So and we, need to, we need a process that works so that the judiciary can do its work. Thomas Jipping, Christine Lucius, thank you both very much. Thank you.